God Sees the Truth But Waits by Leo Tolstoy In the town of Vladimir lived a young merchant named Ivan Dmitris Askinov. He had two shops and a house of his own. Askinov was a handsome, fair-haired, curly-headed fellow, full of fun and very fond of singing. When quite a young man, he had been given to drink and was riotous when he had too much. But after he married, he gave up drinking, except now and then. One summer, Askinov was going to the Nizhny fair, and as he bade goodbye to his family, his wife said to him, Ivan Dmitrich, do not start today. I have had a bad dream about you. Askinov laughed and said, Oh, you are afraid that when I get to the fair, I shall go on a spree. His wife replied, I do not know what I am afraid of. All I know is I had a bad dream. I dreamt you returned from the town, and when you took off your cap, I saw that your hair was quite gray. Askinov laughed. Well, that's a lucky sign, said he. See if I don't sell out all my goods and bring you some presents from the fair. So he said goodbye to his family and drove away. When he traveled halfway, he met a merchant whom he knew, and they put up at the same inn for the night. They had some tea together, and then went to bed in adjoining rooms. It was not Askinov's habit to sleep late, and, wishing to travel while it was still cool, he aroused his driver before dawn and told him to put in the horses. Then he made his way across to the landlord of the inn, who lived in a cottage at the back, paid his bill, and continued his journey. When he'd gone about twenty-five miles, he stopped for the horses to be fed. Askinov rested a while in the passage of the inn, and then he stepped out onto the porch, and ordering a samovar to be heated, he got out his guitar and began to play. Suddenly a troika drove up with tinkling bells, and an official lighted, followed by two soldiers. He came to Askinov and began to question him, asking him who he was and whence he came. Askinov answered him fully and said, Won't you have some tea with me? But the official went on cross-questioning him and asking him, Where did you spend last night? Were you alone or with a fellow merchant? Did you see another merchant this morning? Why did you leave the inn before dawn? Askinov wondered why he asked all these questions, but he described all that had happened and then added, Why do you cross-question me as if I were a thief or a robber? I am traveling on business of my own, and there is no need to question me. Then the official calling the soldiers said, I am the police officer of this district, and I question you because the merchant with whom you spent last night has been found with his throat cut. We must search your things. They entered the house. The soldiers and the police officer unstrapped Askinov's luggage and searched it. Suddenly the officer drew a knife out of the bag, crying, Whose knife is this? Askinov looked, and seeing a blood-stained knife taken from his bag, he was frightened. How is it there is blood on this knife? Askinov tried to answer, but could hardly utter a word, and only stammered, I, I don't know. Not mine. Then the police officer said, This morning, the merchant was found in bed with his throat cut. You are the only person who could have done it. The house was locked from inside, and no one else is there. Here is this blood-stained knife in your bag, and your face and manner betray you. Tell me how you killed him, and how much money you stole. Askinov swore he'd not done it. They did not see the merchant after they had tea together. They had no money except 8,000 rubles of his own, and that the knife was not his. But his voice was broken, his face pale, and he trembled with fear as though he, w w as though he was guilty. The police officer ordered the soldiers to bind Askinov and put him in the cart. As he tied his feet together and flung him into the cart, Askinov crossed himself and wept. His money and goods were taken from him, and he was sent to the nearest town and imprisoned there. Enquiries as to his character were made in Vladimir. The merchants and other inhabitants of that town said that in former days he used to drink and waste his time, but that he was a good man. Then the trial came on. He was charged with murdering a merchant from Ryzan and robbing him of 20,000 rubles. His wife was in despair and did not know what to believe. Her children were all quite small. One was a baby at her breast. Taking them all with her, she went to the town where her husband was in jail. At first she was not allowed to see him, but after much begging, she obtained permission from the officials and was taken to him. 
When she saw her husband in prison dress and in chains, shut up with thieves and criminals, she fell down and did not come to her senses for a long time. Then she drew her children near to her and sat down near him. She told him of things at home and asked about what had happened to him. He told her all and she asked, Well, what can we do now? Well, we must petition the Tsar not to let an innocent man perish. His wife told him that she'd sent a petition to the Tsar, but it had not been accepted. Askinov did not reply, but only looked downcast. Then his wife said, It was not for nothing I dreamt your hair had turned gray. You remember? You should not have started that day. And passing her fingers through his hair, she said, Vanya, dearest, tell your wife the truth. Was it not you who did it? So you too suspect me, said Askinov, and hiding his face in his hands, he began to weep. Then a soldier came to say that the wife and children must go away and Askinov said goodbye to his family for the last time. When they were gone, Askinov recalled what had been said, and when he remembered that his wife had also suspected him, he said to himself, It seems that only God can know the truth. It is to him alone we must appeal, and from him alone expect mercy. Askinov wrote no more petitions. He gave up all hope and only prayed to God. Askinov was condemned to be flogged and sent to the mines. So he was flogged with a knot, and when the wounds made by the knot were healed, he was driven to Siberia with other convicts. For twenty-six years, Askinov lived as a convict in Siberia. His hair turned white as snow, and his beard grew long, thin, and gray. All his mirth went. He stooped. He walked slowly, spoke little, and never laughed. But he often prayed. In prison, Askinov learned to make boots and earned a little money with which he bought the lives of the saints. He read this book when there was light enough in the prison, and on Sundays in the prison church, he read the lessons and sang in the choir, for his voice was still good. The prison authorities liked Askinov for his meekness, and his fellow prisoners respected him. They called him Grandfather and the Saint. When they wanted to petition the prison authorities about anything, they always made Askinov their spokesman. And when there were quarrels among the prisoners, they came to him to put things right, and to judge the matter. No news reached Askinov from his home, and he did not even know if his wife and children were still alive. One day a fresh gang of convicts came to the prison. In the evening, the old prisoners collected round the new ones and asked them what towns or villages they came from, and what they were sentenced for. Among the rest, Askinov sat down near the newcomers and listened with downcast air to what was said. One of the new convicts, a tall, strong man of sixty, with a closely cropped gray beard, was telling the others what he'd been arrested for. Well, friends, he said, I only took a horse that was tied to a sledge, and I was arrested and accused of stealing. I said I'd only taken it to get home quicker, and that I'd let it go. Besides, the driver was a personal friend of mine, so I said it's all right. No, they said, you stole it. But how or where I stole it, they could not say. I once really did so, did something wrong, and ought by rights to have come here long ago, but that time I was not found out. Now I've been sent here for nothing at all. <clears throat> yeah, but it's lies, I'm telling you. I've been to Siberia before, but I did not stay long. Where are you from? asked someone. From Vladimir. My family are of that town. My name is Makar, and they also call me Semyonich. Askinov raised his head and said, Tell me, Semyonovich. You know anything of the merchants of Askinov of Vladimir? Are they still alive? Well, know them. Of course I do. The Askinovs are rich, though their father's in Siberia. A sinner like ourselves, it seems. As for you, Grandad, how did you come here? Askinov did not like to speak of his misfortune. He only sighed and said, For my sins I've been in prison these twenty-six years. Well, what sins? asked Makar Semyevich. But Askinov only said, well, well, I must have deserved it. He would have said no more, but his companions told the newcomers how Askinov came to be in Siberia, how someone had killed a merchant and had put the knife among Askinov's things, and Askinov had been unjustly condemned. When Makyar Semenovich had heard this, he looked at Askinov and slapped his own knee and exclaimed, Well, oh, this is wonderful, really wonderful, but how old you've grown, Grandad." The others asked him why he was so surprised, and where he'd seen Askinov before. 
but Makar Semyevich did not reply. He only said, It's wonderful that we should meet here, lads. These words made Askinov wonder whether this man knew who had killed the merchant. So he said, Perhaps, Semyonich, you've heard of that affair, or maybe you've seen me before. Oh, how could I help hearing? The world's full of rumors. But it's a long time ago, and I've forgotten what I've heard. Perhaps you heard who killed the merchant, asked Askinov. Makar Semyonich laughed and replied, It must have been him in whose bag the knife was found. If someone else hid the knife there, he's not a thief till he's caught, as the saying is. How could anyone put a knife into your bag while it was under your head? It would surely have woke you up. When Askinov heard these words, he felt sure that this was the man who had killed the merchant. He rose and went away. All that night, Askinov lay awake. He felt terribly unhappy, and all sorts of images rose in his mind. There was the image of his wife as she was when he parted from her to go to the fair. He saw her as if she were present. Her face and her eyes rose before him. He heard her speak and laugh. Then he saw his children quite little as they were at the time, one with a little cloak on and another at his mother's breast. And then he remembered himself as he used to be, young and merry. He remembered how he sat playing the guitar on the porch of the inn when he was arrested, and how free from care he had been. He saw in his mind the place where he was flogged, the executioner and the people standing around, the chains, the convicts, all the twenty-six years of his prison life and his premature old age. The thought of it all made him so wretched that he was ready to kill himself. And it's all that villain's doing, thought Askinov. And his anger was so great against Makar Semenich that he longed for vengeance, even if he himself should perish for it. He kept repeating prayers all night, but could get no peace. During the day he did not go near Makar Semenich, or even look at him. A fortnight passed in this way. Askinov could not sleep at night and was so miserable that he did not know what to do. One night as he was walking about the prison, he noticed some earth that came rolling out from under one of the shelves on which the prisoners slept. He stopped to see what it was. Suddenly Makar Semyonich crept out from under the shelf, looked up at Askinov with a frightened face. Askinov tried to pass without looking at him, but Makar seized his hand and told him he dug a hole under the wall getting rid of the earth by putting it into his high boots and emptying it out every day on the road when the prisoners were driven to their work. Just you keep quiet, old man, and you shall get out too. If you blab, they'll flog the life out of me. But I will kill you first. Askinov trembled with anger as he looked at his enemy. He drew his hand away, saying, I have no wish to escape, and you have no need to kill me. You killed me long ago. As to telling of you, I may do so or not as God shall direct. Next day, when the convicts were led out to work, the convoy soldiers noticed that one or other of the prisoners emptied some earth out of his boots. The prison was searched, and the tunnel found. The governor came and questioned all the prisoners to find out who had dug the hole. They all denied any knowledge of it. Those who knew were not to betray Makar Semyonich, knowing he'd be flogged almost to death. At last, the governor turned to Asknoff, to whom he knew to be a just man, and said, Well, you're a truthful old man. Tell me before God, who dug the hole? Makar Semyonich stood as if he were quite unconcerned, looking at the governor and not so much as glancing at Askinov. Askinov's lips and hands trembled, and for a long time he could not utter a word. He thought, Why should I screen him who ruined my life? Let him pay for what I've suffered. But if I tell, they'll probably flog the life out of him, and maybe I suspect him wrongly. And after all, what good would it be to me? Well, old man, repeated the governor, tell me the truth. Who has been digging under the wall? Askinov glanced at Mark Makar Semyonich and said, I cannot say, your honor. It is not God's will that I should tell. Do what you like with me. I am in your hands. However much the governor tried, Askinov would say no more. And so the matter had to be left. That night when Askinov was lying on his bed and just beginning to doze, Someone came quietly and sat down on his bed. He peered through the darkness and recognized Makar. "'What more do you want of me?' asked Askinov. "'Why have you come here?' Makar Semyonich was silent. So Askinov sat up and said, "'What do you want? Go away or I'll call the guard.' Makar Semyonich bent close over Askinov and whispered, "'Ivan Dmitrich, forgive me.' 
What for? asked Askinov. It was I who killed the merchant and hid the knife among your things. I meant to kill you too, but I heard a noise outside, so I hid the knife in your bag and escaped out of the window. Askinov was silent and did not know what to say. But Karasemyanich slid off the bed shelf and knelt upon the ground. Ivan Dmitrich, he said, forgive me. For the love of God, forgive me. I will confess that it was I who killed the merchant, and you'll be released and can go to your home. Well, it's easy for you to talk, said Askinov. But I've suffered for you these twenty-six years. Where can I go to now? My wife is dead and my children have forgotten me. I have nowhere to go. Makar Semyonich did not rise, but beat his head on the floor. Ivan Dmitrich, please forgive me, he cried. When they flogged me with the knot, it was not so hard to bear as it is to see you now. Yet you had pity on me and did not tell. For Christ's sake, forgive me, wretch that I am. And he began to sob. When Asknav heard him sobbing, he too began to weep. God will forgive you, said he. Maybe I'm a hundred times worse than you. And at these words, his heart grew light, and the longing for home left him. He no longer had any desire to leave the prison, but only hoped for his last hour to come. In spite of what Asknav had said, Makar Semyonich confessed his guilt. But when the order for his release came, Askinov was already dead.